to speak to you uh, today. I, I want to just do a promo for the next trimester, the children's classes. Everybody's ready, curriculum is ready, teachers are ready. Please bring your children so they can learn about God in that atmosphere and also so that they can have fellowship with their classmates and get to know them. And we appreciate so much uh, our teachers and the curriculum that's been uh, devised for them and the efforts that they put out. I'm going to put a promo in for the adult auditorium class too. We're going to be studying a combination of Ephesians, Colossians together. I'm taking the next uh, trimester off of preaching in order to teach this class and facilitate it, and I am so excited about it. It's going to be different. I'm looking forward to it. Um, when you come in, you might want to just sit up front or put your stuff in the place where you feel comfortable, but then come sit up front because we're going to be doing different things. So as you saw Rick do bringing you up front for uh, the DBS uh, two-part two series, that's what I'm going to ask you to do when we have class together because there are going to be times that I'm going to ask you to just turn to your neighbor and talk to you, you know, talk about something that is in the class and hopefully it will be something that you guys will come to a greater understanding with. So it will be somewhat different, and I hope that you will be here. I hope that you will also uh, study or at least read Ephesians through and then read Colossians through. And, and I think it will be a great study for us. So I, I just want to take you back in time to the Old Testament. It, we don't know the exact date, probably somewhere around 1250 B.C., Okay, and Moses has just died, and he has already given the people the second reading of the law. God has taken his body and buried it in a place where no one would ever find it. And now God appears to Joshua, the commander, the general. Of, of the Israelite, the host of Israel, so to speak. And, he, and he's going to talk to him. And he's going to encourage him about something that I think that all of us will be encouraged about. And so here is Joshua. And if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Joshua 1. I'm going to have the text on the screen, but uh, you can't get all of the text that I want us to read this morning on one screen, and, but you can have it on one page in your Bible, Joshua, the first chapter. <clears throat> and I want you to notice some of the things that you are going to see here. These are really words of a king to a general. And I know that they're from God to Joshua. But I, I want you to be careful to note <laughs> that God does not talk to Joshua about the training of the men, the taking of everybody's metal that they have and beating them into weapons. He doesn't talk about military strategy. Why not? Because the battle is really not going to be Joshua's. And the victory will really not be the Israelites' victory. It will be God's. The battle and the victory belong to the Lord. And I hope that's what you go away with today. Let's begin reading in Joshua, the first chapter, and we'll read verses 1 through 9. <clears throat> After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people into the land that I am giving them to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses, from the wilderness of this Lebanon, as far as the great river, 
the great river Euphrates and all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, by the way, that's the Mediterranean Sea if you did not know it, toward the going down of the setting of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you in all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. Be strong. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be very strong and courageous, being careful to do all of the law that I commanded Moses, my servant. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left hand that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, and that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. What a beautiful statement that God makes to Joshua. And you know, when we listen to these words, I, I come up with four basic things that God is trying to get across to Joshua. Number one would be this. Your enemy cannot stand before you. That's a, that's a beautiful thought. You know, that's a beautiful statement that Jesus says to us as well today. Your enemy cannot stand before you. Over and again in Joshua, the enemies of Israel, if you read that book, they fled. They had greater military weapons. They had walled cities. They had military men that were trained. And they fled from the armies of God. Because God said they would. He had given that land to them. Secondly, he says, and he says it three times. And I just think that because he said it three times, there's got to be an import here. Be strong and courageous. He says at the end of it, don't fear. We're going to deal with that reason later on in the lesson today so just suffice it to say God really impresses upon him not to be deterred not to be frightened not to be thinking we cannot do this thirdly he says be careful to follow my word I, I, I tell you that there's as long as I've lived there is not a time in my life ever that I thought anything could be a better use of my time on this earth than meditating on God's Word. And so often I lose out on that. Joshua and the people were to follow his word in order to have success and keep that law and obey it and know it just like Moses did. And finally, he says, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to fight for you. God never intended that the Israelites would be so mightily strong in their appearance and in everything that they had put together for war, that the Israelites would come away thinking, we won the battle. God always wanted them to understand it was He that was giving them the victory. God was the one who was fighting for them. And so... <clears throat> We see this happening again and again. And I, I think it's quite interesting that just a few chapters later, they go against the first city, Jericho. And we kind of all know that story. 
But what was the military strategy? <laughs> Walk around that walled city one time each day for seven days and seven times on the seventh day. Blow the, blow the uh, ram's horns and say something really, really loud and then take the city. Now that, that is about the craziest military strategy I have ever heard in my life. And those walls fell down and all of those people fled and God kept his promise and they took that city it, it's it's a beautiful story of victory in the Old Testament that's how Israel these things achieved victory in taking the promised land now before we get into what we can learn today from Josh 1, 1 let me make sure that we're all on the same page with who our enemy is. Our, our enemy is not people. We don't fight in the Lord's army against nations. And, and we don't, our enemy is not dangerous political ideas or dangerous moral ideas, etc. Our enemy truly is in the unseen world. We fight against spirits. And you say, whoa, Mark, I don't know how to fight against spirits. In fact, I don't even know whether I believe in those spirits, you know. <laughs> We've come into the age of reason, haven't we, in the world. We've come into this time where, where we, don't, we don't believe something unless we see it. And that's foolish, of course, because I don't ever see gravity, and I totally believe in it. And I've never seen Abraham Lincoln. I totally believe that he exists. And I've never seen a lot of things, and I believe them. But I will tell you what. That's not our war. That's not our battle today. Our battle is against spirits, ultimately. And yes, those spirits do things in our world that sometimes give us great consternation. I get that. Okay, but what we need to do is recognize that we're fighting against evil. Evil defined is the defilement of any part of God's good creation. And the devil is the enemy of all that's good and the promoter of everything that is evil. I want us to take a look now at Ephesians, the sixth chapter. And when we look at this passage here, it is so clear. I think Dan brought this out to us not too long ago in his sermon. And I want to take a little bit different tack when we look at it today. So this is Paul at the end of this letter. And he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly or spiritual realms, places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all, stand firm. Uh, here's the question that, that I want to ask you as we look at this passage. What did God say to us that was any different from what he said to Joshua? Well, I believe he says exactly the same thing. He says, your enemy will not be able to stand before you. He's saying, you need to be strong and courageous. He, need, he says, you need to take up the whole armor of God. If you look at the whole armor of God in Ephesians, you're going to be taking up the sword of the Spirit, the Spirit who gave the word. You're going to be putting on... <coughs> Uh, a helmet of salvation, a salvation that's talked to us and given to us through the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. 
You're going, to be, you're going to be arming yourself with those things against the world. And the last thing that he says to us is that he's going to be with us and he's going to fight for us. The battle still belongs to the Lord. <clears throat> so when Joshua and the Israelites would speak of victory, they would be speaking of defeating the armies of the Canaanites. But when we speak of victory, we speak of a victory over evil. How do we see that, though? Well, we had testimonies of it this morning in our Bible study. When, when, when one of the men got up here and said, I saw a man who was this, and then he was changed to be this by the Word of God. Yesterday, I was doing a Zoom study. One is the girlfriend the other one is the boyfriend. The girlfriend is in the body of Christ. The boyfriend has yet to do that. And we pray every week and we go kind of round robin for each week. And so I asked the boyfriend, who's not the Christian, would you, would you go ahead and pray? And the first time I had asked him to ever do that, he, did, he just absolutely did not know what to say. And, and he, he said three words, maybe, and amended. it. And I said, thank you. And then we went on. Yesterday, this is what his girlfriend did. Right after the prayer was over, she went like this. And she looked at him like, I cannot believe you prayed that way. There was change in him. That's a victory for good, brothers and sisters. When there's change in you, that is a victory for good. That is a victory of good over evil. When you determine to do something that you may have never done before, and it might seem crazy like walking around some city seven times in one day and shouting out Jehovah's name, but I am telling you, when you do things like this, when you become a better person, that is a victory in Jesus Christ. And you can't have the glory for it because we don't. We cannot fight against Satan unless we have the Lord Jesus Christ as the commander of our lives. And so... When we see this, we have to recognize that victory in Jesus is a victory over the devil and his angels or demons, if you want to call them that, and everything they represent. And in the book of Ephesians, when God says he lifts up the church, he's lifting up the saved of all the world. And he's saying to those spiritual forces, this is the victory. In my son, Jesus Christ. As I said in a sermon not too long ago, the devil does not just want to annoy us. He doesn't want to just trip us up and make our lives miserable. He's not, you know, necessarily behind the fact that you had a fender bender today. No, that's not his ultimate goal. His ultimate goal is to kill you in your spirit. It's a spiritual battle for your soul. That is his ultimate goal. He is a roaring lion. He seeks whom he will devour. Spiritual death, of course, is the worst thing that could ever happen to us. He might have control over our physical lives, but Jesus said, don't be fearful of the one that can put your body to death. But fear him, respect him, who can put both body and soul in hell. Spiritual death would be the worst thing that ever happened. But it does not have to happen to any of us. Because our victory is in Jesus Christ. So we, we do the same thing. Wonderful, beautiful verse in John. First, excuse me, 1 John, 5th chapter, and in verse 4. This is what John says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And faith, that, that word sometimes, I don't know, it kind of seems ethereal to us. Uh, as I was telling this man 
that I was teaching or, and <laughs> the other day, I said sometimes religious words take on a kind of a meaning of their own and they really don't have much meaning to us because we just say them and, and then we just go on. And it's kind of like the word church because people confuse a building. The church is people, you know, but, but we have to think them through. Well, faith, uh, there's a really, really good other word that I think helps us understand it. Trust. Trust Jesus. That's what Joshua had to do. Trust in God. Whatever he tells me to do and wherever he wants me to go and however he wants me to be inside, trust God and do it because that's the faith that overcomes the world. You know, when God told Joshua that the battle had already been won, he tells us the same thing. I, I just, I can't imagine what it would be like not knowing that Jesus Christ is our victory. I can't imagine what it would be like not knowing that when the end of life or the end of the world comes, that, that it's not been settled, that the script hasn't been written that we don't know who wins. You know, <laughs> we have been talking about uh, the Greeks somewhat and, and uh, King Ahasuerus and the Persians uh, in our last class and Esther. And I thought about what those Athenians thought when Darius I, Ahasuerus' um, father, went to fight against the Athenians. And he's coming with hordes of Persians. Some say 60,000. Others say up to 100,000. At any rate, the Athenians are outnumbered at least six to one when they meet them at the Battle of Marathon. Six to one, maybe even 10 to one. How do you think the people felt inside of the city of Athens? How do you think they're feeling on the day of the battle? What anxiety are they having at that time? If one could tell them that, that the news would be this, you're going to lose, then at least they could flee the city. You're going to win, then they, they wouldn't have that anxiety. I, I'm telling you, the Lord tells us the battle is his. The battle is his. And let me show you how he tells us that. Look at Revelation here. And I don't know when this happened. You can't ask me that happened. Never ask me the, this question. When did that happen in heaven? They're not subject to time. I have no idea. I, I, don't, I don't get how to answer that. But, but now, war. I'm going to have to read it from this. <clears throat> so this, this war that is in heaven, whenever it happened, the result is what is important. Now, war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven and the great dragon was thrown down in the ancient the that ancient serpent who is called the devil and satan and the deceiver of the whole world do you think he wants us to get the message there he gives almost every name of satan and the whole bible right there from the beginning in garden of eden Okay, he was thrown down to the earth and his angels or demons were thrown down with him. Therefore, let's get to the next passage here. Therefore, verse 12 of that same chapter, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that the time is short. Now, I, I show you that because sometimes when we think, well, if the devil's lost, if he knows he's lost, why does he care anymore? The Bible tells us why he does. The Bible tells us exactly what his purpose is. First of all, he's upset. He is upset very wrathful that he has lost the battle. And then verse 17, then the dragon became furious 
with the woman. In, in book of Revelation and, verse, and in chapter 12, I believe the woman represents the church and all of her offspring would represent the church as well, okay? And, and he went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood at the sand of the sea. You see, that's the thing. He's furious. He's upset that he's lost. One, uh, one uh, sermon I heard not too long ago um, reminded me of an instance that I actually saw in my real life when I was a kid. Uh, we got, I don't know, 22 little chicks from the fair one time. And uh, those were in the days where you could have them in your backyard, you know, and we had all these chicks running around. Those chicks began to grow up, you know, and they, they became chickens. And, and then I said, Mom, what are we going to do with all these chickens? And she said, we're going to eat them. I said, oh, okay. I said, well, how do you kill them? I'm like seven or something. Huh? How do you do that? You know, she said, well, you'll see one day if you want to watch me. So she grabbed hold of a chicken one day by its feet. She took it over to the clothesline. She wound it up by its feet on the clothesline. And I hope there are no small children in here. And the head went off. But what was interesting is that she was killing three and one of them got down. One of them fell off without its head and was running all over the yard. And I looked at it and I said what is it doing she said yeah it's dead but it doesn't know it Mark and it's kind of crazy you know and that's where we get the saying running around like a chicken with your head cut off and then the the preacher who was preaching the sermon he said that's kind of what Satan's doing he knows he's lost he knows he has a death sentence and he's going to hell but he's like a chicken with its head cut off, and he's just going around messing up everything. He's furious that he's lost. We have the victory in Jesus in a beautiful way. The victorious Christian understands, according to Romans the 8th chapter, that we are more than conquerors in him who loves us us you know I know sometimes I get it I, I, I get how we don't feel victorious at times do you always just feel that <laughs> I don't I don't sometimes we feel weak don't we sometimes we walk out to life and we just think can anything else go wrong and, and we're focused kind of on those things. And, and I get that, that, and the Lord gets it that we feel weak. But here's the thing that I think is beautiful about God. You remember Paul, I think he was frustrated with the thorn in the flesh. I think it really bothered him. And whatever that was, I think it was a physical thing, but you can think whatever it was. But whatever it was, he asked God three times, will you please take it from me? It's a real annoyance. It's really getting to me. Like, I don't know, my eye, it keeps breaking blood vessels and this one and this one. It's really getting to me. You know, but his was much worse. I know it was. So, so he says that. And the Lord says something back to him that is absolutely just important for every soldier of Christ. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul, and my power is perfected in your weakness. So when you feel weak, when you feel like life has beat you down to the point where you just cannot even think of getting up, you recognize that your Lord and Savior is with you. You reconcile, you reconcile in your mind that the commander-in-chief of your army is already victorious, and so are you. And you get back up, and you do the thing that he says, stand, stand firm. That's a military term. That's a military command. If your general tells you as an infantryman, stand 
That means you don't retreat. You don't shrink back, as it says in Hebrews 10, 38. You decide you're going to stand because no matter how fearful it may be in your mind, the Lord has the victory for all of us. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we give you great thanks for all that you have done for us. For the victory that we have in your son, he is the one, Father, that has gone through the greatest trial in the history of the world. No one has had to go through what he has to go through. And yet he came out victorious because he is God. We are not, Father, and sometimes we feel weak. But you have told us to be strong and courageous, to trust in you, and to recognize that the battle is truly yours. Thank you, Father, for winning the battle. Thank you for putting Satan in his place. And we pledge, Father, to you that we will keep on fighting and keep on standing firm against all of that evil that is representative on earth of all of that that's going on in a spiritual realm. You have given us the key to victory, our faith, our trust in you. May it ever be that way. In the name of Jesus, amen. Have a great week in the Lord, everyone.